let's go ahead and talk about preferred stock and what are referred to as dividend preferences. Uh, preferred dividends. Preferred shareholders have preference over common shareholders. That is, they get paid before the common shareholders do. If the corporation is going to be liquidated, um, first the creditors get paid off, then the preferred shareholders get paid off, and last of all the common shareholders. If dividends are paid out, the preferred shareholders get paid first, the common shareholders get paid last. So they bear less risk. In exchange for this reduced risk, preferred shareholders generally have a limit to their rewards as well. Again, there's this risk-reward trade-off that we operate under. Now, preferred dividends are usually expressed as, either, as a fixed amount per share, either as a percentage of the par value or as a stated dollar amount per share. Now, let's assume that in 2001 you purchased one share of $100 par, 8% preferred stock. Now again, what that means is your annual dividend will be 8% of the par value, or $8 per share. And you buy this because it seems safe, and you're looking forward to a steady income stream of $8 per year. And in that, in that first year, in 2001, the corporation decides not to pay dividends. And again, dividends are discretionary on the part of the board of directors, and if they don't feel it's appropriate, then they don't have to pay dividends. But you think, okay, there's, there's always next year. In 2002, they don't pay dividends, nor in 03, 04, 05, 06, all the way through 2010. So you've gone 10 years without any dividends. Finally, in 2011, they declare dividends. They send you your check for $8, and then they give billions of dollars to the common shareholders. Obviously, you're not very happy about this. Um, you thought you were in a safer position relative to the common shareholders. You've been given a, a token $8 payment after 11 years, and the common shareholders have made out like bandits. What can be done about this? Um, first off, preferred stock is sometimes cumulative. That means that any skipped dividends, they're referred to as dividends in arrears, must be paid before the common shareholders get anything. So that sort of avoids that problem of missing dividends and then having the common shareholders get a lot of money. Now, even if the preferred stock is cumulative, it's still not a very exciting investment. Uh, you know, the best case, you'll get $8 per year going off into perpetuity. You're not going to get rich buying this stock. Um, you're getting a fixed return, you're st and you're still bearing more risk than creditors. You know, generally, you're going to be getting a slightly higher return, assuming the dividend is paid, a slightly higher return than the bondholders do, but you're bearing more risk also, because again, if the firm liquidates, the bondholders are going to get paid off before the preferred shareholders. So in that case, why not simply buy a bond which will be much safer and, you know, in exchange for a marginally less, marginally smaller yield. Now again, the cash flows from a share of this preferred, assuming the best case, where dividends are paid each year, is $8 per year. Now, $8 per year stretching out, you know, into perpetuity is referred to as a perpetuity. So a perpetuity is an annuity that goes on forever. Now the present value of perpetuity is very easy to calculate. It's simply the amount of the payment divided by the discount rate, or divided by the interest rate. So in this case, if market rates are 8%, the present value of that perpetual dividend stream is $8 divided by 0 0.08, or $100. If the rates fall to 7%, the present value of those cash flows, and therefore the price of the preferred stock, rises to $8 divided by 0 0.07, or $114.29. And as rates fall, the value of the preferred rises, you know, again, assuming that the dividends are still being paid, but there is a practical limit to how low um, discount rates will go for a preferred stock. How can we make the preferred more attractive then, so that people will pay a higher price for it? How can we make this? How can we make this investment, um, you know, a little jazzier, a little bit more um, appealing to those who, you know, want to take a chance on making a lot of money? We can make preferred stock participating, which means that the preferred shareholders can receive more than their stated dividend. In other words, they can they can participate in excess distributions. Okay, so participating dividends. Usually participation is limited. If you let the preferred shareholders receive unlimited additional amounts of dividends, then they'd be getting a return as high as the common shareholders while bearing less risk. So again, we've got this risk-reward trade-off. The common shareholders bear the most risk, so they should be in the position of getting the most potential reward. Now participation usually kicks in only after the common shareholders have received some amount of money. Now the text assumes that this sum amount is the same percentage of par value that the preferred got. So for example, we've got that 8% preferred example we've been talking about. Um, so first the preferred shareholders will get their 8%, and 
and then the common shareholders would also get 8% of the common stock par value. In reality, um, the amount given to the common shareholders is often expressed as a dollar amount per share. So for example, the preferred participates after the common gets 50 cents per share. One of the reasons for that is, again, the common stock generally has either no par value or a trivial par value. So if your par value is one-tenth of one cent, getting an 8% dividend on one-tenth of one cent par value is essentially meaningless. So that's why the, the amount given to the common is often expressed as a, as a fixed dollar amount per share. Once the preferred shareholders start participating, um, they're going to receive additional money, and often there's a cap put on that as well. Again, the idea being that if, if it was unlimited potential participation, um, the preferred shareholders would be getting too much. Okay, so dividend preferences. Um, this involves the question of if we've got cash to distribute as dividends and we've got more than one class of stock, which class of stock gets how much money? Now, if we've got both preferred and common shares and we need to allocate dividends, we're going to follow the following pattern. Now, not all steps will apply in all cases. This is sort of a generic one-size-fits-all four-step process. First step is to allocate any cumulative preferred dividends in arrears. Obviously, if the preferred stock is not cumulative or if there are no dividends in arrears, then step one doesn't apply. After doing that, we allocate the current year's stated or fixed preferred dividend. Then we give something to the common shareholders. Um, again, the textbook tends to assume that this something is a percentage of par value. Otherwise, we'll assume it's a fixed amount per share. If the preferred stock is not cumulative, then at step three, we'll give everything to the common shareholders. If the preferred stock is cumulative, then we'll give something to the common shareholders, and whatever's left is going to be split between the common and the participating preferred based on some formula or criteria. Okay, let's go ahead and do some examples of dividend preference problems. Uh, we'll use the same classes of stock and the same amount of money for all of our examples. Let's assume we've got two classes of stock. We've got 10,000 shares of $100 par 6% preferred stock and 500,000 shares of $1 par common stock. And let's assume that dividends have not been paid in the preceding two years and that we have $250,000 to distribute. In the first case, let's assume that the preferred is not cumulative and it is not participating. So let's go ahead and set up our allocation. Step one, pay any preferred dividends in arrears. And again, the preferred is not cumulative, therefore there are no dividends in arrears, even though it hasn't been paid. Step two, we give the preferred shareholders their current year dividend. Now again, it's $100 par 6% stock, so that's $6 per share on 10,000 shares is $60,000. In step three, we give something to the common shareholders. And again, the preferred is not participating. That means that in step three, we give everything that's left to the common shareholders. We had $250,000 total. We allocated $60,000 to the preferred, which means there's $190,000 left for the common shareholders. Participation, nothing. For totals of $60,000 for the preferred and $190,000 for the common. Okay, same example, but now let's go to case B, and let's assume the preferred is cumulative, but it's still not participating. So again, the first step is to, is to allocate any preferred dividends in arrears. 60,000 per year, just like before, for the two years that are in arrears, so $120,000 to allocate the preferred dividends in arrears. After that, we give the preferred shareholders their current year dividend, so we're now up to 180,000, at the stage, third stage, something for the common shareholders. Again, the preferred is not participating, so whatever's left goes to the common shareholders. We've allocated 180,000 to the preferred, which means there's 70,000 left, which all goes to the common shareholders. Again, no participation, so the totals 180,000 for the preferred, 70,000 for the common. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to case C, and again, we'll have the same classes of stock we had before. And well, again, we'll assume that dividends are two years in arrears and that we've got $250,000 to distribute. In case C, let's assume the preferred is cumulative and fully participating after the common shareholders receive 10 cents per share. In this case, fully participating means there's no limit or cap to the additional dividends the preferred shareholders might receive. Once they start getting additional money, that will continue without limit until the money is exhausted. We always start in the same place, dividends and arrears, and again, Two years at 60,000 per year, there's 120,000 in arrears. Next, we do the current preferred stock dividends, 60,000. 
And again, now we give something to the common shareholders. Um, that something now is 10 cents per share. So 500,000 shares at 10 cents a piece is 50,000. So, so far we've allocated 180,000 to the preferred, 50,000 to the common, that's a total of $230,000. So we've got $20,000 left. That's gonna be allocated on the basis of the relative par values of the two classes of stock. The preferred stock has a total par value of $1 million, 10,000 shares times $100. The common stock has a par value of $500,000, so that's a 2 to 1 ratio. So that $20,000 will be split on a 2 to 1 ratio between the preferred and the common. So 13,333 for the preferred, 6,667 for the common, and now we get our totals, 193,333 for the preferred, 56,667 for the common. Case D, and again, same classes of stock as before, same information. But now in case D, we're going to assume the preferred is not cumulative, so there will be no dividends in arrears, and they're gonna participate after the common shareholders get 25 cents per share. But now we're gonna place a limit on the participation. Participation is gonna be limited to an additional 2% of par value. Again, if there's unlimited participation, um, that means that the preferred shareholders might be getting more of a return than is justified by the lessened risk that they bear relative to the common shareholders. So again, in this case, no dividends in arrears because it's not cumulative. We give the preferred shareholders their current year's stated dividend of $60,000. And again, something for the common. In this case, that something is 25 cents per share on 500,000 shares or $125,000. Now, among, between the first three stages, we've allocated $185,000 so there's $65,000 left, and we're gonna allocate that based on relative par values up to that 2% cap for the preferred shareholders. Now there's a total par value of $1.5 million. $65,000 represents 4.33% of par, so if we simply split it based on relative par values, we'd be giving the preferred shareholders too much. Instead, we'll give them their 2%, and the remainder will go to the common shareholders. Um, again, if we were to allocate that $65,000 based on, you know, straight based on relative par values, the preferred shareholders would get two-thirds of that, or about $43,000, which would be about 4.3% of their par value. So that'd be way too much, and so we're going to give them their, their maximum allowed, and whatever's left goes to the common shareholders. And so our total is $80,000 for the preferred, $170,000 for the common. Now the problem with this example, let's move on to the next one. In case E, again, same information as before, but now, again, we're going to assume the preferred is not cumulative and participates after the common gets 25 cents per share, but now the participation is gonna be limited to an additional 5% of par value. And again, in the previous example, we found that the $65,000 we had represented 4.33% of the total par value of the two classes of stock. If we simply gave the preferred shareholders their 5% of par as the participation, the preferred shareholders would be getting more than 4.33%. The common would be necessarily getting less than 4.33%. So again, step one, dividends and arrears, not applicable in this case. Step two, the current preferred stock dividend, 60,000. Step three, something for common, 125,000. And again, we've got $65,000 left, just like in the previous case, and we're gonna allocate it based on relative par values up to a maximum of 5%. And again, as I said a moment ago, we do not simply want to give the preferred shareholders 5% or 50,000. If we do that, the preferred shareholders get 5% or 50,000. The common shareholders get 15,000, which is only 3% of their par value. Instead, we'll split the $65,000 based on the relative par values subject to or up to that 5% limit. In this case, um, we can give the preferred shareholders 4.33% of par will give each class 4.33% of par value. So there's the participation, again, split on a you know, two to one basis, essentially, for totals of 103,333 for the preferred, 146,667 for the common.